Right, thank you for coming back, everybody. Uh, this uh, session now is a, is a panel on gender segregation veil and women's body autonomy. Uh, the panel is chaired by Yasmin Rahman. She spoke earlier, so you know what she um, uh, what she's like. Um, she's great. <laughs> But right. <laughs> to pay justice to the range of work that she does, um, I'm just going to very briefly go over. Uh, I, I have to. I have to do this because I think it's it's important here. <laughs> it's important. She's done 20 years work on uh, violence against women, and she's worked in very. Pardon? <laughs> See, the, the the good thing is that um, we get the biography updated on. <laughs> Here as well. So I'm going to go over this uh, meticulously. 30 years, 30 years she's worked uh, on uh, um, violence against women, face, gender, and equality issues. She's done many research and work on polygamy, I think, and, um, and law. Uh, it's um, outstanding. Um, I've heard her speak on this issue a couple of years ago in London. Um, she's done many work. She's worked for Metropolitan Police uh, as advisor and a national coordinator on many, many projects. Currently, she's advisor to City of London Police and a member of S Center for Secular Space. Please welcome Yasmin Rahman back to um, on, on the and the and the panel on gender segregation, well, and women's body autonomy. Okay. Thank you. I'm really embarrassed now. <laughs> um, right, before I introduce the panel, I just, I'm going to again say this is in tribute to, to Mariam and the incredible work that she does. But look at the range of women and countries that are represented in this room and the range of issues, and this panel is, is no different. We have uh, women from the Ukraine, from Poland, from Russia. Um, women representing Muslim communities um, or from of Muslim heritage, women of Jewish heritage. We're, we're not just talking about Islamic fundamentalism. This is an issue that cuts across faith boundaries, national boundaries, um, every boundary that you can think of. So um, I've stepped in for Caroline, who unfortunately can't be here today. Um, and um, I'm really honoured to be chairing this panel. I'm not going to say much, which, which is a first for me. Um, I'm just going to introduce the speakers very, very briefly. And when, well, when I introduce them, you'll see how briefly. And then I'm going to give you each three minutes um, to speak about the work that you do and the context that you're, you're working in. And then I want to open it up to discussion because I think, um, I think you would all appreciate an opportunity to ask questions and to engage with us um, up here on the stage. So, I need the glasses. This is the 30 years showing. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I have um, to my left, Ahlem Akram, who is founder of Basira, which is a secular women's organization um, working with British um, Arab women and, um, and trying to promote their rights. To my right, I have Eve Sachs, who is trustee of the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance here in the UK. Um, Homa, next to Eve is Homa um, Arjamand, I hope I said that right, who's coordinator of the campaign for one secular school system. Going back here, this is the order I wrote it down in, not the order of people on the panel. Um, we have Ina, who many of us here in the room know, who is the leader of Femin um, and does some amazing activist work um, in, um, in the Ukraine and, and in Russia and challenging Putin and who's just generally fabulous. Uh, then we have um, Nina, who is the vice president of the Atheist Foundation in Poland, and she'll tell us more about that when she speaks. And last but by no means least, we've got Julia Almova, who um, founded an NGO in St. Petersburg, helping children and young people and families of um, labor migrants. And she's currently coordinator of the EVES Project, um, a Russian... Finnish Feminist Education Project. So um, join me in thanking this amazing panel of women. So um, I think I'm going to start with Eve. Um, so over to you. 
Right, so my name's Eve Sachs. I'm a trustee of JOFA, the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance in the UK. Um, I wanted to say that um, these issues are most relevant for women who are living in the ultra-Orthodox part of the Jewish community where extreme gender segregation in all aspects of life is practiced. In schools, synagogues, social events, lectures. And although I'm not part of that community, I've reached out to the women who are in this community and sadly, these women are unable to speak out in these matters because they risk shun basically communal shunning if they were to object. Yeah. Um, many um, of them would like to move to the moderate part of the Jewish community or leave at all, but for multiple reasons, they're unable to do so. Um, so I think it's important to remember that not everybody in religious communities wants to be there and wants to be subject to some of the rules there. Um, women are raised in the public sphere in this community. Even photographs of them are always blurred out. So young girls are being brought up in these communities where the only newspapers and books they see only have pictures of men. Um, girls, are even, girls' faces are blurred out even on toy packaging in the shops. And some of this actually has trickled into the mainstream part of the Jewish community as well. There's a leaflet that comes through my door, pictures of men, no pictures of women. Um, and I've actually protested for a couple of times. There's a communal Hanukkah lighting in Trafalgar Square. Adult women are never permitted to sing. Only children and men are allowed to sing because um, hearing a woman's voice, Kalisha, that could be provocative to men. Um, the, 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 or, the, the organisers of the Trafalgar Square or Hanukkah lighting, they cater for the strictest men and not for the marginalised women. Um, it's common in main, um, also, it's common in mainstream synagogues to put on lectures just for men, just for women. So there's gender segregation in all parts of the Jewish community. Um, in the mainstream part of the Jewish community, the hats are required. But actually, it's only a fascinator and it's only during the service. So I'm more concerned with the ultra-Orthodox community where women are not only expected to cover their hair with a hat or a wig, or in some cases both, but they're also obliged to shave their heads underneath to ensure that no one and not even the walls of their house should accidentally see their hair because they don't have any. Um, there's no scope for dissent in these communities and the hair coverings agreed between the father of the bride and the groom before the wedding. The, the bride's often just around 18 years old. And even if a woman's husband is more flexible, wearing a non-standard hair, hair covering like a hat um, that you could buy in the high street would solicitate people gossiping, staring. And um, also women in this community are not permitted to drive and if they do drive, they would result in their children being expelled from their schools. And in it, that's in a community where there's no choice about which schools to send to. Um, so that's how the driving ban's enforced. Um, in this community, there's also no bodily, body autonomy. The girls are brought up not understanding that they should have any. Married at 18, 19 to somebody they often haven't met before. Um, marital relations um, on the wedding night is um, required and they have to be available to their husband and that seemed to be a divine requirement so that if, some, if they go to the rabbi that they don't want to, the rabbis who are obviously male will, will defend the man's right even if the woman's not happy with the situation. So I've hopefully covered both. Yes, gosh. <laughs> well, um, and the similarities given you know, the history of antagonism between our two communities the similarities in terms of control of women is something that the fundamentalists of both hues um, share um, with, with many of, of similar rules. Um, the hearing of women's voices resonated with me because that's something I was told when I was growing up is you mustn't speak loudly, which is why I always blame my parents for having a quiet voice, um, <laughs> is um, because no man should ever hear your voice. So a very yes. similar thing. Um, I'm going to go to Homer next. Yeah. Thank you, Eve. So uh, I'm not going to talk about all the pressures that women um, are facing in so-called Islamic communities or Jewish communities or even Catholic communities and so many other minorities uh, because you've heard it all. I'm going to talk about solution. What can we do? The reality is we cannot lift this uh, social pressure on these women unless we all in this room decide, plus the whole frontline fighters for ecology decide what to do. So in order to lift this pressure, we need to establish one secular school system, one secular law for everyone. And in order to do that, you need to demolish multiculturalism and cultural relativism because they are contradicting each other. You cannot really have a secular state but also respecting culture which is belonged to 1400 years ago. 
you cannot really establish a secular state and secular school when you're allowing the parents to send the children, even if your school is public school, is funded by the government and is secular, but you're allowing the parents to send the children to private madrasa, which is Sharia school, or private Hebrew school, or private Catholic schools, or any other um, that religious school. So therefore, in order to lift, in order to expect this woman to come forward and take their chador or hijab and be equal to men and have a voice and have a loud voice like Roma, you need to lift this pressure from them in order to do that because they inside the community which is totally pressed by the, not only the family member, by community leaders, their individual rights are totally demolished by minority rights. In order to really do something about it, you need to enforce secularism in these communities, not respecting the culture, enforcing secularism. So any mullah, any rabbi, any uh, priest who tries to marry these people, who tries to enforce uh, religious uh, dogma on children, they need to be tried, uh, in my opinion, in public. That's the only way you can lift the pressure on these women. Otherwise, they face consequences. The least consequences they face is disowned by family members and community members. And what can they do without any support? They grew up in these families. They're frontline fighters. They, they challenge their family members, but they can't challenge neighbors, uncles, aunties, mullahs, rabbis, and everyone. As a result, the least consequences disown, the harsh consequences is honor killed or transported to another country for the sake of marriage, doesn't matter whom, arranged marriage, and all that. So we need the government, first, to demolish multiculturalism, Second, to make sure there is no sensitivity towards any culture. And the third, to establish the secular state. And of course, public education is mandated because we need more frontline fighters. Thank you. Thank you, Homa. I'm going to move on to Nina now. Well, so I maybe will add something to my presentation. I'm a long date feminist as well, and atheist humanist. Uh, as vice president of uh, our foundation, foundation named after uh, Kazimierz Ruszczyński, who was in 17th century a very big philosopher who wrote the, uh, who, uh, wrote the treaty, the non-existentia dei, uh, we are organizing every year, we've been organizing since 2014, the Atheist Days, and I invite you warmly to this event because in Poland, under the National Catholic rule of uh, very, uh, even with uh, some color of fascists, uh, we need support and we need to reaffirm, confirm our right to think freely, and our right to freedom of conscience or uh, speech of science, media, art, etc. And I'm also editor of the first ever atheist, uh, atheistic review in Poland, even under the so-called communist rule. Rule: There was no uh, review, no media with atheism in the name. And so it is the first, unfortunately for the time being, only in Polish. And now what I would like to stress in, in my um, speech. Uh, you don't need to be a, a Muslim woman and uh, live under Sharia law to be a third a citizen of third class. Why third? Probably you understand why uh, not the first, because first are the male citizens. But the second now in Poland, and not only 
I think in Ohio and Mississippi and other countries, it's now the same. Second class citizen is an unborn citizen. And after those two, only we have women. And it is the situation that we cannot uh, accept. Our uh, foundation is defending all uh, the rights of all minorities uh, discriminated against on uh, religious, from religious motivation. So our big concern uh, are also women's rights. But it is not enough to fight for women's rights, for equality. We have to fight for a society which will allow to have it, which will allow to imply those principles. And now, uh, on 11 uh, November, Poland uh, celebrated uh, 100 years of independence. Uh, and our government uh, uh, organized for this occasion uh, an independence march together with members of Polish and foreign uh, openly fascist uh, formations, fascist movements, 200,000 of them marched march on the street of Warsaw. It's a big scandal. And also uh, in November on 28, Polish women will celebrate 100 years of their voting rights. But in the current situation, is it the reason for celebration? Uh, Polish women, as I already mentioned, became now in Poland the third class citizens. Um, and their reproductive rights uh, were then denied. First it was in 93, and uh, afterwards, every year, every time, we have repeatedly uh, attacks on women's rights to make this anti-abortion right in Poland, uh, anti-abortion law in Poland even more restricted. Now we have ban on abortion with three exceptions, and our right, because it is our populist and sometimes conservative also right, which is a light to the church and which uh, want to impose in Poland on Polish women the total abortion, now want, under the pressure of the church, that women in Poland give uh, birth even to uh, unviable uh, fetus, even uh, to uh, give the birth to the children just to see how they are dying. Why? because the leader of our ruling party uh, said they have to do it and to, to bring those children uh, to baptize them. So you see, in such a climate, you cannot speak about bodily autonomy. It is not the bodily autonomy that we are speaking about. It is the right to autodetermination. It is right to, to be human being. Because uh, it is not only your body which is concerned. It's your very existence in a whole which is endangered like that. So I don't know what will be our next round. And I can speak more in details um, there, um, later on. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure I have words um, to follow that, so I'm going to go to Julia. Yeah, well, uh, Russia is quite a big country, so we have uh, a large variety of issues. And to begin with, uh, uh, like the ruling church now is the Christian Orthodox Church, uh, and uh, uh, it can be compared now to a governmental 
uh, agency because on the one hand uh, it receives uh, it receives uh, funding from the state its organization um, gets a lot of grants from the state it nearly doesn't pay taxes and on the other hand uh, it uh, implements a function of promoting uh, so-called traditional values uh, which is uh, really profitable now for the government. Uh, as uh, you know, on the uh, international arena, uh, Russia, Russian government tries to show off, to show that we are a great military uh, power. And uh, in, uh, inter, um, in internal uh, politics, uh, it's uh, actually the same. Uh, so they need to promote these uh, gender stereotypes that uh, the uh, destiny of uh, a woman is to give birth uh, and to be a good wife uh, and the destiny of man is to be a breadwinner uh, but still to be obedient to uh, the government uh, because in Russia we really love uh, this saying that all power is from God. Uh, so it, it's really, um, it goes hand in hand now. Uh, and uh, um, the spokespersons of uh, um, Christian Orthodox Church, uh, they uh, like to make uh, a lot of ridiculous statements, uh, like, for example, that uh, women should, uh, uh, should dress uh, so that they wouldn't provoke men to rape them, and that we need to, to uh, uh, introduce a dress code for women, uh, that women have to uh, like stay at home, and of course they talk also a lot about banning abortion and I wonder why haven't they banned abortion yet <laughs> because there are a lot of uh, talks about this. Uh, but in uh, some districts of Russia there are uh, paralegal uh, measures uh, such as like a week without abortions. Uh, or uh, in some districts you need to get a certificate from uh, a priest uh, that you have uh, consulted with him, and only then you can make an abortion. Um, so this is how, how it is now. Uh, but there are also, as I said, Russia is quite large, so there are also districts uh, when you just cannot uh, make an abortion. Legally you can, but practically you uh, cannot. I'm now talking about uh, North uh, Caucasus region, uh, like Chechnya, for example, Chechen region. and. Uh, if we dwell on uh, this region, uh, then we should also uh, uh, recall uh, honor killings, which are widespread, and there are a lot of publications in independent media about this, uh, that there is uh, um, uh, child marriage, but chi by child I mean that, for example, uh, there was um, a big case when uh, a police officer, a 50-year-old uh, year police officer, decided to uh, take as a second uh, wife uh, a 17-year-old uh, schoolgirl. And uh, her family was against this, and uh, they even uh, reached out for the media. But uh, in the end, uh, uh, the wedding took place, and it was shown like uh, on television even. Uh, and uh, the um, officer on children's rights of, of Russia, uh, he said that, well, you need to uh, think about the, it's another region, you know, and their women, they uh, shrink and wrinkle at the age of 27. So what do you want? It's okay for them to uh, marry early. <laughs> so you can see uh, this, uh, like, very uh, exotification, yes, of another country to, uh, not, not another country, another uh, culture to uh, justify the violence. Uh, and in another uh, region in Dagestan, uh, we have uh, female genital mutilation. And uh, commenting on the report of, uh, on genital uh, mutilation, uh, the uh, also spokesperson, a very like top 
executive of uh, the Muslim uh, community, uh, he said that, uh, yes, I think uh, all women should undergo genital mutilation because uh, there is too much sexualization in the society. And the uh, Orthodox Church priest, uh, he defended uh, this guy and he said, well, he didn't say anything horrible, uh, you know? Uh, no, I think that Orthodox women shouldn't undergo uh, genital mutilation because they are uh, diligent by themselves. So they don't need it. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, to, to con also, um, moreover, we also have uh, close connection with post-Soviet Union countries, and we have a lot of uh, migration, labor migration in, into Russia. Uh, and uh, of course, women in migrant communities, they are often, uh, they are also not protected, and they often face like double discrimination because they are migrants and uh, they have uh, like fluctuating rights and uh, because they are women and they can be discriminated inside their community. So there is a wide range of <laughs> problems here. Nadia is laughing at me and it's because as chair I kind of feel like I should say something after each speaker but um, I'm a bit gobsmacked, so I'm going to try and collect my thoughts and, <laughs> and then say something at the end. Um, Ina. <laughs> um, thank you. As uh, someone who belongs to a group of women who manifested their rebellious <coughs> body and did not ask for anybody's permission throughout the years, I will come back to this question um, of women's bodily autonomy and Generally, why do we have to talk about women's body when we talk about religions? And more generally, again, why do we have to talk about women's body every time we talk about uh, women's oppression, discrimination of women? And I'll give you an answer, I'll be brave enough and confident enough. It's because this woman's body has always been a battlefield. It's a battlefield on which religious institutions religious ideologies stage historical uh, war against women. And um, religious institutions and, re and um, uh, religious um, uh, dogmas make a big part of, uh, they are responsible for a big part of this century-long histor historical conflict. Um, this conflict lasts for very long. And it's a result of um, continuous opposition between religious dogma and the progress of women's rights and women's rights as such. And this conflict was not initiated and is not wished, is not supported by women themselves today. Um, we can see that this conflict continues to be actual in our women's fight, in our feminist fight, because we continue hearing how um, religious institutions with their male leadership, how um, relig in religious dogma, woman's body continues to be considered as sinful, dirty, always guilty, always wrong. And this body has to be hidden from public to protect men and to protect society. This body is always claimed to be wrong and dangerous until today. We hear from different parts of the world um, various speeches, we read various headlines um, daily. Um, how women's body, um, how different parts of women's body um, are considered to be obscene, wrong, um, and if they're exposed, they are considered to be dangerous and therefore women have to be persecuted. And this is the reason why us, um, with Feminine Movement, we put in the center uh, of our fight, we put in the center this body to claim that there is nothing wrong with our body and this body is not supposed to be um, hidden and therefore we're going to um, expose it in front of the rest of the world to show that we are proud of those bodies and not, are not ready to hide them. And we can, we, we've seen by the reactions, we've seen by activists from um, other feminist movement who dare to uh, question and to challenge this idea um, uh, idea of religious institutions that woman's body is wrong and has to be kind of regulated. There should be many traditions and um, many rules um, applied to this body. We've seen by the violent reaction 
on um, our challenging of their rules and traditions, they are not ready to reconsider, to review, um, to change their perception of women's body. We continue to see how um, on each part of women's body there are numerous uh, laws, rules, uh, numerous visions and perceptions, patriarchal perceptions are um, projected. And now here we've heard um, some of the speakers who mentioned um, that they, are, they have always problems with our hair. Um, others mentioned um, the reproductive rights. But indeed, there is no part of woman's body which is free from religious traditions and religious rules. There is just simply no free part of our body. And if we just go from head to toe, we scan this body, we will see how they don't want to let our heads free, they want to control our thinking, they want to control our hair once again, they want to cover our eyes, they want to shut our mouth, they want um, our bellies to be only um, connected to the, our um, reproductive uh, function, they're obsessed with controlling our vaginas, once again uh, with abortion laws, they are even adopt uh, barbaric traditions um, and claim that, that they, are, they are religious traditions, such traditions as fe female genital mutilation in some parts of the world. They're obsessed with controlling each part of women's body. And my point is that because they are continue to be obsessed with controlling this body, it's our duty today to finally say that we're going to liberate this body. Because through liberation of our own body, we will liberate our own spirits, our minds, and ourselves in general. So I'm here, if I'm here today um, to bring something, to add something to these amazing voices of women who've shared their experience, I'm here to give, to make this call to take finally back our, our bodies into the hands of its rightful owner, to women. And not to accept anymore the, their definition of who we are, of what our body signifies, of what this body is for, what is the mission of this body, but finally say that it's us who are going to define what my body is about, what it's going to be, when it will be sexual, this body, and when it will be political, when it's going to serve my political interest. So this is my call today to every woman in the room. I'm sorry, gentlemen, for once you're not concerned. <laughs> <laughs> so I skip that. But I also want, I cannot keep silence about, well, I just said that I was so inspired and so touched by every female voice we've heard um, today. And their powerful stories and the, the testimonies about their resistance. But I also cannot ignore the fact that I'm also very hurt daily um, in the latest times and I'm really um, afraid simply as a woman, not uh, as a feminine activist or a campaigner, but just simply as a woman. I'm hurt to see how many of fellow women are actually embracing this system of um, male dominance and this idea that your body by, by definition is sexual. How many um, women today claim that they are religious feminists, putting their religious identity in front, their feminist aspirations. We also heard, we also hear today how many women claim that all these religious traditions and rights is something that protects them. It's something that defends and protects their dignity. Well, I will not question the, the, their choice. They are indeed very free to choose conservative ideas, patriarchal ideas, and apply them to their life. But I think that we cannot allow that these ideas will, be, will penetrate feminist ideas and will hijack feminism, and that modesty dress code will be presented as a sort of a way um, of protecting yourself and ensuring your security or um, pro protecting your dignity. I, I'm very disturbed by this idea. And then sometimes I challenge my own perceptions about those uh, claims and those arguments made by those women. And then I say to myself that indeed, probably in some situations, those, this modesty dress code maybe protected some of them from harassment, from rape, maybe. But then once again, why women's body has to be protected? I think that if in the first place religious dogmas would not define this body as wrong, obscene, sinful, and dangerous, we wouldn't need even to think about that this body should be protected. So I think that all of this has to be challenged. 
all of this should not be ignored or silenced, especially within feminist movements. And I think that we should not let um, this, their ideas to hijack um, the movement for women's liberation and uh, the, the movement that, on which we count a lot, the worldwide movement that will reclaim women's uh, bodily autonomy. And I think that today with the rise of uh, female voices about sexual violence, sexual harassment, that we've heard the, all those testimonies um, of Me Too campaign that come from various groups, communities, and society, including religious uh, women who spoke out against the uh, um, harassment and sexual aggressions in religious communities, uh, in religious, um, um, uh, in the places of worship. I think that it's once again, it's about making our own voices heard and saying that today it's us who are going to define who we are, how we're going to live, and what our religions also stand for. I think that it's also time that religions also would be, um, that rel religious institutions would uh, be embodied in women's body, that religious authority would be represented by in women's body, and that women's voices would also claim that my religion stands for those ideas and not for patriarchal notions, not brings with it patriarchal notions. So I believe that this is the way, at least I'm very intrigued myself by this idea, and I believe that there are many ways still, many strategies to, that we can explore to um, continue to resist um, the rise of and the penetration of our lives by, fam uh, by um, patriarchal religious ideas. And I just want to say that we as women should not feel afraid uh, to speak out, to manifest our bodies as rebellious. We should not hesitate. We should not feel afraid to hurt someone's feelings. We should not feel afraid to hurt their feelings because they never hesitated and felt afraid of hurting our own lives. And I think that finally we should stop asking ourselves who is going to let us be who we want to be? Who is going to let us be free? We should start, start asking ourselves who's going to stop us? Who's going to be able to stop us? Thank you. Um, You've had your call to arms um, on to Ellen. Well, it's very hard to carry on from this. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, simply, I agree with everything, except that I'm going to take it from a different perspective. But before I do that, I'd like to say something which uh, was discussed in the previous uh, panel, uh, just for one minute or less. Uh, they were talking about alcohol. Uh, my, 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 my way of talking about what we are going through is that by discrediting the call for Sharia councils or for Sharia as a whole, and go back to it is interpretation of four males, and they differ. The funniest thing is that their consensus, anything in consensus came on women's body and women, but the rest they differ, differ in their opinions, such as alcohol. Alcohol in Islam, yes, three of them have agreed that it is banned and it shouldn't be drunk. But Abu Hanifa have said, no, you can drink alcohol as long as you don't go to pray while you are drunk. <laughs> so, so this is the way we have to question what's next for us with this Islamic uh, interpretation, religious interpretation. Uh, what I would like to stick on, now you can start counting. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will start by, uh, one day I was driving in the East End around three o'clock and I was shocked. It was the time of the uh, schooling, the girls out of schools. And to be honest with you, it saddens me as much as it shocked me when I saw how many young girls, young ones, not only who are wearing hijab and dressed up in a, in a way. I, I mean, it, it made me think. So I'm going to take hijab in particular and take it from the beginning. When was the rise of hijab? The rise of, because, I mean, I grew up in a Muslim country and I was born in the faith and I'm still in. Uh, but I have never seen it while I was growing up. The hijab started, promotion for hijab started by 67 loss of the war with Israel. 
because uh, the scholars said that Israel has won the war because they follow their religion, while we did not follow our, ours. Of course, it came after that in 79, the Islamic Revolution, Khomeini. And both all of those Islamists are wanting, they, they just wanted to show the Islamic awakening and they connected it to women's body. Women's body that uh, it was encouraged in every possible way. It started by putting the hijab and then uh, segregation between societies. Uh, uh, of course, it was connected with a political voice that the rise of political Islam. And the, the, the strangest thing at that time is that they, they succeeded, if I look at the Arab world or the Muslim world today, it saddens me to say that they have succeeded in that because when I go back, I found 70, if not 80% of women and young girls are wearing hijab. And the contradictory in that is that they wear the hijab and that they wear the most tightest jeans and the biggest uh, makeup and God knows what. So anyway, what was the aim? The aim was the emphasis of the collective identity, the ummah identity, the, the Islamic awakening. And there were many times when I questioned that, why the Islamic awakening only came to put a hijab on a woman and a young girl? Why, why it did not come to, be, to give justice for women in three family status law, you know, in all of these uh, countries? Uh, nobody managed to give me an answer. They, they, of course, the easiest way to shut any question is that, that this is Allah's call, this is God's call. I, did, I differ for in that respect because I don't think God could be that cruel to make me a less of a human being and not entitled to breathe at least. I don't want to work naked, but I don't want to be wrapped up, especially in the heat. And this is the argument I use it most of the time, a lot of time with with women back home or around me with the, when they talk about hijab and it's, it's, it's a necessity. No, it's not. Hijab is still a debatable issue. Nobody, not a single sec, a, a scholar, have managed to prove 100% that it is uh, in, in any text or anything. So the question is, they connected it with women's body as being a blemish, connected it to honor, connected it to so many other things. Uh, but basically, again, that we are different. We are superior. We are different in our religion. We, are, we carry the truth. And we should not emulate any of the Western countries, the Kafir and all of this. Now, I don't want to carry on with this. I have so much. But, but what, really, what really scares me is the government here accepting all of these changes in the community, in the society at large, and, and really keeping a big loopholes in democracy. And not only this, we are sandwiched between Islamophobia and, and, uh, uh, and uh, political correctness that anything we talk, you know, it's, it's against it, it, we, we lose freedom of speech. We use freedom to criticize. Islam or any other religion, they all are more or less the same. And actually, I'm so impressed to hear what you have said at the beginning. Because the more I dig up in, 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 in where we got a lot of these things, I found out <laughs> we are so similar, so similar when it comes to women's rights and women and all of this. And the rise on both, in, on both sides and nowadays. And this is new as well. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it is scary, it is scary. So really, uh, I'm going to say one more thing. Uh, recently, as a, a, a Abu Dhabi company have been, of course, everybody wants to get a, a more money and <laughs> do something. And of course, the easiest way is through, uh, through religious stuff. How could you say no? Anyway, a company in Abu Dhabi have invented a, a Muslim dolls. And Muslim dolls are, two of them are without a hijab, while three are with a hijab. What are you trying to say? What are you trying to say to the young little girls? And what saddens me most as well, if we are gonna go on universality of rights, there is a huge violation of children's rights by the law in Malaysia, where 
a, a girl is, is, is obliged to wear a hijab from the age of seven. Mm -hmm. I'll stand here, but I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, uh, Nina wants to add something and then I'm going to make some comments. Nina, quick. Ah, one minute. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. I wanted what to add something, something to the, uh, my three minute speech. Okay. Uh, I would like to connect the question of independence march, march of fascists in Warsaw and uh, the question of uh, bodily autonomy. Uh, first, uh, Jules Ferry, uh, a big re Republican. Uh, activist in France said that uh, celui qui tient la femme tient tout et c'est pourquoi l'église la tient c'est pourquoi la démocratie do doit le lui enlever en, in very short uh, he, he, he who holds woman holds everything and uh, that's why church holds her and that's why democracy has to take her over, to take her back. And why church uh, do that? What is the uh, connection with fascists? Uh, it's political question. It's the question of control, of power, of authoritarian power, of uh, patriarchal authoritarian power. That is the key of this question. Uh, it is, uh, of course, there is a question of sexuality, but it's, uh, it's uh, who control fertility of women, control the whole society, the whole country. And that's what started in Poland with depriving women of their rights, now ended up with the authoritarian rule, with the dis, uh, with destruction, with elimination of separation of powers, of executive, legislative, and judicial powers, with the destructions of all democratic procedures. That's the uh, main mechanism. First, you oppress women, and then, you deprive every members of society of their rights. And that's what I think is the more important uh, question. And that's the lesson that we can teach others uh, based on our experience. I'm sorry. That's OK. Thank, thank you, Nina. Um, I think that was a really important thing to say. Um, other, other members of the panel have asked to also add things, but I'm going to um, exercise chair's prerogative and say no, um, only because I want to open up to the audience. But before I do, there's a couple of points I want to make very quickly. Today is the 25th of November. It's the International Day of the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls. And you've heard from the speakers just the threats that women and girls face across the world, and also boys, because we look when we look at boys who are abused, whether that's physically, sexually, emotionally, it is at the hands of men, overwhelmingly. And I think we have to remember that. And this, this battle is long, but you know, we, we continue with the fight. And by siloing the work, saying that this group of people only suffer these sorts of issues, we lose opportunities to make connections and stand together. And I think that's something we need as activists, as feminists, to come together and learn to do better and learn more of. Um, there's two things that struck me. One is children and where children sit in all of this, because we've talked about children in the hijab, the messages we give to young girls and the control over their bodies. The UK is a signatory to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Within that, is the right to play. Our daughters need to be free to play. They have as much right to feel the wind in their hair as their brothers do. Mm. And also sending them to madrasas or any other form of religious schooling after school, where does that leave their right to an education, a secular education, and their right to play? 
And lastly, before I open it up to you, why are women the holders of honour? Why are women the ones who are always held responsible for what men do? Don't go out at night because you may get attacked. Don't wear a mini skirt. Don't drink alcohol. Don't uncover your hair. And yet, the contradiction is men are the ones in charge. Men are less emotional. Men can, can you know, uh, you know, that they can make decisions and they're not kind of affected by hormones in the way that women are. It's about time we told the men in the room, not just here, but men everywhere, don't rape us, don't abuse us, don't violate us. Yes! It's time to stop. <laughs> and if you're one of the men who isn't violent, if you're one of the men who isn't violent, then stand up, don't shut us up, but stand up next to us and tell the other men that it is time to stop. Now I'm going to open up to questions. <laughs> right, and you want, want to collect... ask a question after that? <laughs> Did you want to collect a few questions at once? Sorry? Should we collect a few questions yes, at once? Yes, please. Um, hello, I'm Megan from the National Secular Society. Thank you so much um, for all of those uh, statements. Um, Firstly, I absolutely agree that um, uh, women's rights have been oppressed by religion and particularly the idea that uh, religion seeks to control all of women's bodies. That's absolutely true. Um, I'd also like to put, uh, pick up on a point that Yasmin made, that this isn't just an issue about women's bodily autonomy either. Um, I don't know if you've been following the news from America that a female genital cutter... Um, has basically been let off from mutilating girls' genitals. And part of the reason for that was because in American law, as it is indeed in British law, there's no protection against boys in the, in the same circumstances. There's no protection against um, infants and um, male children from male circumcision. So I think when we're talking about bodily autonomy, you have to address both points. It, we really have to address both women's and men's bodily autonomy. In both cases, it's religion that seeks to control it, that seeks to control sexuality. And I think that fighting for the rights of boys to their bodily autonomy is the same as fighting, fighting for the rights of girls. You have to fight for both in order to win the argument. So thank you. Okay. Carrying the mic, am I allowed to have a question as well? Uh, yes, Jimmy, go ahead. So I, I just, in this conversation about the hijab and the covering of women, I think in Western liberal democracies where we see anti-Muslim bigotry, women who wear hijab are often on the front line of that violence. So how do we navigate the rise of hijabis in popular culture? So when we see things like Grey's Anatomy or The Walking Dead or other TV shows where we're seeing hijabi women represented, and often that's done as a way to normalize hijabis because we know that when we normalize people, we move, we move violence against them. How do we navigate that at the same time as not promoting the hijab as a, as a, as a feminist item of clothing? Okay, thank you. We'll take some more questions. Thanks. Hi. Um, okay. This isn't really a question, I have to confess, but it is following on from those ideas about the hijab and so forth. I think you really have to look into the theological rationale. And this does involve men because it suggests that men do not have autonomy over their own bodies, <laughs> that they can't control their own bodies. And Yasmin just cited the myth that you know men are more rational, men are more capable of making decisions. If this is From the a case... theological perspective, not a personal perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I right. can say some but to that's what they say, which is why they're, you know, in leadership positions, they're able to have, take adult responsibility. For example, they have driver's license, they have the right to vote. They are treated like adult agents in every single case, except when it comes to their sexuality, where suddenly they can't be responsible. So I think we really have to call them on that double standard because this is in the logic of the religious dress code, is that men don't possess autonomy. Well, if they don't, then they shouldn't have the kind of responsibilities that they have elsewhere. Okay. They should be treated like children. <laughs> Thank you. You can take one, just these two questions here. Of, right, 
yeah, two, we'll take two questions. We've only got 10 minutes left. Sorry. Hi, my but. name is Fifa, and I'm former head of policy for the Malaysian AIDS Council. Um, I want to ask Eve, could I get a sense of your, um, your thoughts on the viability of a joint campaign between the Jewish community and the Muslim community <laughs> on forced um, head coverings? Um, and also, um, Alam, could you um, sort of um, provide more detail on the, the seven-year-olds forced to wear hijab? Because we're both Malaysian and we were a little bit um, confused about that. What has Islam ever done for women? <laughs> Best question yet. Okay. You can, you, you can have that one. <laughs> before, before, I'll just... Um, can Ellen, can we just second? go to the other questions first? Is that okay? Right, so, um, Eve, on the joint campaign. Right, so... Wow. Well, okay, so I just wanted to... So the, in, in terms of the head covering, I think that it's going to be very difficult to have a campaign on that because I think that um, the religious leaders are going to argue that the women are doing it because they want to. But I do think there's scope for a joint campaign. The thing that I'm particularly interested in at the moment is on bodily autonomy is the government have announced rules for um, sex and relationship education in schools. And actually, it's the children in these faith schools that need this education more than any other child in the country, and we should all acknowledge that. But yet, it's male imams and rabbis who are coming to the government and who are lobbying against this legislation. And I just want everybody in this room to think about what's going on now. The government have said that they want um, girls to know that domestic violence is wrong, to know that they have it, they, they can say no to sex even within a marriage, mm -hmm. that the girls should know what contraception is, mm -hmm. to know what termination is. And, and you've got these male leaders coming along and arguing, and it's been in the papers week in, week out, um, for them arguing that it's against their religious freedoms. And in terms of a joint campaign, I think that would be an absolutely excellent one. And it's current and it's happening now. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, can I go to Ellen and then I'll come to you? Ellen, on the last question. Yes. Uh, I, first of all, seven years. I was told I was in Malaysia last year, last Christmas, and I was told by a few women over there, you know, that this is obligatory. This is a government thing that girls at the age of seven, because that's what I have seen everywhere. And when I ask, that's what I, the answer. Now, what Islam has brought to women? I would love if each and everyone, for one less than a minute, just close your eyes and imagine Arabia. 1400 years ago, how was it? Where, I mean, they were Muslims, they were Christians, they were Hanafi, they were Sabi'i. There were so many, so many religions in those times. But the question is now, what Islam brought for women? Uh, uh, Islam did not get out neither from Judaism nor from Christianity. The only two rights is we, they, we say that Islam brought for women. The first right is part of the inheritance, which does not, I mean, because in those days, this inheritance part, it wasn't in Judaism, neither in Christianity. So part of inheritance, which is peanuts, you know, and just imagine a woman, a woman having a, a her husband pass away and she gets one eighth of his inheritance. And if she doesn't have a son, then his the rest of his family share his, uh, the the estate, so this is one one thing, but uh, the other one is uh, the right to ask for a divorce to initiate divorce again, which wasn't in Judaism or Christianity. But you have to look at the consequences of initiating a divorce, which is called in Islam khula, a khula to get out of a marriage. You are supposed to give up all your rights as a woman, a belated dowry which doesn't, uh, uh, it loses its value by inflation. You have to give up custody for your children. You have to return to the, to the husband everything and then you get a quick divorce within four months. So this is where when we talk about the religion, we talk that Islam is like any other religion. Yes, it might have been suitable at that time, in that era, in a, in a desert. But in today's world, it is not, it, you cannot, it's incompatible. Sorry. It's, in, it's, it's to, res, to, to maintain respect. If you want to maintain respect for the faith, 
you have to reform it. You have to bring it or keep it as it is. The, the, no. the, the best no. way is segregation, complete, sorry, complete separation of state and religion to, to, to go forward. Otherwise, we are all stuck. And the implication is going to reach to every single part of the world. Can, no, 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 sorry, sorry, I'm going to have to stop you. Sorry. Um, yeah. um, can I go to Huma? You were going to. Yeah, yeah. Oscar. I think one should not make mistake. Hijab is a political statement. It was not around when I was a child and I grew up in Iran. It was not around when I was in England. It's a political statement done by political Islam and influence with money pouring from Saudi Arabia and Syria and Mullah pouring from Iran and, and the government giving so much funded to this so-called cultural sensitivity. No wonder this political Islam can influence some of us, some of women who are coming out and talking about choices. These women are opportunists in my opinion, but they don't know. They don't know they are opportunists. So hijab is a political statement, yes. and the reason we are here to act politically yes. against that political statement. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Ina, Ina wants to come in there. And I'd like to come I in um, going beyond uh, this point, hijab is political, and bringing back this, uh, our attention to the point how religion and politics often collude with each other and how dictator, dictators, male dictators in their majority, collude with religious institutions. And we can see today what is happening today. I don't want to bring it back to history. Let's, talk, let's look at the world today. In um, the USA of Trump, that is so blessed and embraced by many um, religious groups, Women are about, you know, they are getting anxiety about their reproductive right and health care. In Turkey of Erdogan, who is so much emphasizing on um, bringing the value of Islam back, um, he himself, I will quote um, Erdogan, said that woman is complete when she gives birth at least to five children. In, in Russia of Putin, uh, they decriminalize domestic violence. It's no longer a crime in Russia to beat your wife. And all of this was blessing, of course, of religious institutions behind those dictators. Or in the case of Trump, we don't know yet. Um, so I want, to, I want to, to emphasize on this and that we should always pay attention to this rise of, um, you know, the, of giving this place of religion and politics in general, and their, their political no notions about women's rights and human rights in general, they always want to have a say in those questions. And um, we should also, of course, not forget about Pope, the current rock star Pope, who travels around the world and uh, campaigns against um, abortion, even though uh, he is claimed to be so progressive. So let's not forget about that, and I think that really, um, dissociating and disconnecting religion from politics would be a failure in our common fight. So let's just keep it in mind. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry because I know there are lots of you who want to speak. Um, and I'm also not now going to be able to go to the panel for closing comments um, because I'm being kept to time. Um, this is an incredible panel and I think we could have had a whole day on, on this subject alone. Um, I didn't want to answer the question on what has um, Islam done for women, because um, I didn't think it was appropriate for me yeah. to say. Um, I could be committing blasphemy on YouTube. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there is a tension. There is a tension, as Ina pointed out, and others about how do we as feminists stand as allies with women who perhaps take a different view wherever that view comes from. Um, and it, it's a real challenge that we all face. Um, times are difficult, but um, we, we move forward and the gains will be small initially, but we will get there in the end. But thank you very much for your time and thank you to this amazing panel.